On today's show, I'm talking about the judgments that await us when Jesus returns. And Jesus has promised us He's returning and we see the signs all around us. Are you ready for Judgment Day? Are you ready for the coming of Jesus? I'm also talking about Israel. Now, Benny Gantz, who's the Defense Minister of Israel, is saying that Iran is eight weeks away from a nuclear weapon and that they are prepared to attack. Huge issue in the news and I'm answering your questions. I'm Jimmy Evans. Welcome to The Tipping Point Show. So glad that you joined me today for Tipping Point. This is a very special program because I'm talking about the return of the Lord. Now this program is being taped in late August and next week is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And I've been talking about, I personally believe that the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets some year, I don't know if it's this year or next year or whenever it would be, but it's going to be the rapture of the church. I personally believe that. I believe that the scripture clearly reveals that. But there, Jesus is going to return, and when He returns, we're going to stand in judgment. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the signs of the end times. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is talking to His disciples about all the things that are going to be happening at the end times, and they've either happened or happening right now, or they're about to happen. And so this is the news, the, more current than today's newspaper, Matthew chapter 24. But then Jesus makes a change. And he makes a transition talking about preparing for his coming. It's the most important issue in the entire world. And so remember in the days of Noah, because Jesus you know, refers to, we're going to read a scripture here about the days of Noah. Noah looked like a fool. It had never rained on the earth and he was building a massive ship on dry ground. It took him many years to build it. He was a laughing stock. Wasn't close to water. It had never rained. They didn't have the technology to move the ark to water. And everybody's looking at Noah like, you, you idiot. What are you, what are you people doing? And they mocked him. But on the day that Noah got on the boat and they were partying and sinning and rebelling against God and Noah was living for God and preparing for judgment day. That's what I'm talking about on this program today. Preparing for Judgment Day. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One, uh, mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too, you must keep watch, for you do not know, know what day your Lord is coming. And so understand that Jesus Christ is coming and he's saying it's going to be business as usual. People are going to be playing around. People are going to be acting like nothing's going to happen. But there will be a righteous remnant preparing and you're going to look like a bunch of fools, just like Noah did. Now understand this. Noah looked like a fool until he got on the ark and the rain started. And when the rain started and the floodwaters began to rise, he got smarter by the hour. But the world around him was mocking him. I'm living for Jesus. I know that many of you, you're trying to live in these days for Jesus Christ and you're being ridiculed by family members, friends. The world looks at us like a bunch of idiots because I can tell you one thing, in the twinkling of an eye, it all changes. And if you're living for this world, you will not be prepared for the return of Jesus. You will not be prepared for Judgment Day. But if you're living for Jesus, you're going to be prepared. So Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about the signs of the end times. And he says, it's going to be like the days of Noah. You need to be prepared for this. Then in Matthew 25, Jesus tells three parables. In the last program, I talked about the parable of the virgins. Okay, now the parables are all talking about how to prepare for the coming of Jesus and how to prepare for judgment when it comes. The first parable was a parable of the 10 virgins. And Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man will be like, you know, the 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish. Five had oil in their lamps. And when the bridegroom came, they went into the wedding uh, to marry the bridegroom. The other five, they did not have oil in their lamps. And when they tried to get into the door, the bridegroom said, I do not know you. That's the first parable Jesus told. The number one most important thing that you have to do is to know Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I, said, I talked about that a lot. 
in the last program. I'm going to talk about that more again today, except if you don't know Jesus, you need to say a prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Come in and, you know, uh, change me and I submit my life to you and I commit the rest of my life to you. That short prayer will, means Jesus will come into your life, forgive you of your sins, give you the gift of eternal life, and you can know him. Not just about him, but you can know him personally. Well, the second parable was the parable of the talents. So I want to read this to you and we'll then talk about it. But this is the second parable. Uh, warning that Jesus is giving about how to prepare for his return and the coming judgment. Now listen to the language of this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But who had, he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have spent, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have ever received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. From, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the first parable that Jesus told was about knowing him. It was the parable of the virgins. This is about serving him. This, the, a master, the kingdom of heaven is like a master who went on a far journey. That's Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Jesus left the earth to go to the right hand of God the Father. And when he left the earth, he distributed his kingdom Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all the giftings of, of 1 Corinthians, Romans 12, all the giftings God has given his family, every person on the planet, literally, talents, giftings, abilities, however you want to say it. And by the way, it says here that he gave one five, one two, and one one, each according to their own ability. And this is important because it means according to their demonstrated capacity. When the master came to his servants, he had been watching these servants for a long time. And the man who had five talents had already demonstrated the fact he could be faithful with five talents. The one that had two talents had already demonstrated the fact that he could be faithful with two talents. The man who had one talent had it by grace because this man didn't deserve even one talent. But by, by grace, the master gave him a talent. When the master returned, he wanted a prophet. Now listen, your life exists to serve Jesus Christ. And when he returns, he wants to see a profit for what he put in you. In other words, if you're truly living for God, if you're truly serving Jesus, it means you've done something with your life to better other people. You've done something in your life to help the disadvantaged, to, to teach the ignorant, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to reach out in compassion to those who are hurting and to tell other people about Jesus, to be a good witness of Jesus. You don't have to you know, go to China or Africa or something like that and save everybody to, to get to heaven and have a great reward. But whatever talents you have, the gift of hospitality, maybe you have an athletic gift, maybe you have a, a financial gift, maybe you have a spiritual gift, a worship gift, whatever your gift is, it just simply means that you take that gift and you say, Jesus, I, the first purpose of my life is to glorify you and to serve you.
It's the first purpose of my life. It's the reason I'm alive. See, when the master went away and gave his talents to the, to the two, the man with five and the one with two, they knew, they knew why they lived. They knew the reason that they existed was to show a profit for the master. So when he came back, they were, they were ready. And they said, hey, master, guess what? You gave me five. I brought five more. And he said, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And he came to the man with the one talent. The man with the one talent had a bad attitude. In other words, he did not like the master. You're an austere man. You reap where you haven't sown. You gather where you haven't scattered. And the master said, well, if I'm that kind of a person, you should have been even more diligent to make sure you put my money with the bankers. When I came back, at least I would have interest. And he said, throw that man into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That man was not saved. Now, I want you to listen to me. So... Our attitude toward this tells a lot about who we are. Now, there was a, a poll taken by Barna Research, and they were ta talking about why you live your life. In other words, what, what you're alive for. Most people in this Barna Research poll said the number one reason for their life. In fact, let me read this to you. This is, this is the exact quote. This is from Barna Survey. If you look at some of the dominant elements in the American mind and heart today, as illuminated by the inventory, most people believe that the purpose of life is feeling good about yourself. Okay, Most people alive today, you say, why are you alive? And they say, oh, well, I'm alive to feel good about myself. I want to feel good about myself. Really? That's, that's the reason you're living is to feel good about yourself? And I can just say right now, if you're 25 or 30 and you're all good looking and muscled up and all that kind of stuff, hey, I'm 67. I'm telling you the future's out for you. Gravity is going to beat you. I can promise you that right now. And you may feel good about yourself today, but who knows what it's going to be like tomorrow. Maybe you don't have as much money. Maybe you don't have the same opportunities. Maybe something changes. The purpose of my life is not to feel good about myself. The purpose of life is to glorify God. And I can tell you this. If you live your life to feel good about yourself, you're going to live your life just like this. It's going to be emotions and up and down and you can't afford this and you don't do this and these people don't like you and all that kind of stuff like that. If you're living for yourself, life is going to beat you up hard and you will not be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. I can promise you that. Just like the man with one talent. If you're living to glorify God, you will live a great life. And when he returns, you will have, he said, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay. And so the reason I live my life is to serve Jesus Christ. And when he comes back, I'm going to show him a prophet. Now, with my life and my ministry over the years, I know I've led a lot of people to the Lord. I know I've helped a lot of people to understand, you know, things about the Bible and things like that. Well, that's me. I mean, every, every person is an individual. That's me. I'm an imperfect person, I, you know, but in judgment before God. I know that I'm going to have a prophet to show to God. Do you have a prophet you're going to show God? Have you used your giftings to serve the Lord? I, we had dinner, Karen and I had dinner with a, a man and his wife a few months ago, and she's a third grade teacher. And she pastors her student, literally. She prays over her students. She loved those students. She's been a, a teacher for 25 years. And she pastors those students. And I think about her, that woman is going to receive a huge reward in heaven for the love that she's shown those little children in the name of Jesus. She does it for Jesus. She does it at literally pastoring those children. And so you don't have to, have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a world famous evangelist. You, all you have to be is yourself. You have talents. What are you doing with the talents that God has given you? It is a critical question. And if you're using those talents for God, it means you're ready for Jesus. Let me tell you, when I say that, I don't mean full time every day. You have to be doing that. But let me just give you an example of someone that has an athletic gifting. Maybe they're famous athletically, and that's their gifting. They're an athlete, and they play sports, but they're using their influence to do good for people. They're using their influence to be a good example for Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. Using your talent to bring a prophet to Jesus. Let me tell you the third parable here. And the third parable is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, this is, this is a true story. I'm sorry, this is not a parable. This is a true story. And so Jesus says, Matthew 25, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him and he will sit on the throne of his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. 
Then the king will say to those on the right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a, st a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, in so much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. And so the last thing that Jesus is talking about here is loving people. Okay. Now, this is interesting because Jesus said, because you didn't do it to one of the least of these, my brethren. That's talking about the Jewish people. Okay. Also, it could be talking about believers, but I believe it's talking about the Jewish people. There's going to be a judgment of the virgins. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? There's going to be a judgment of the talents. Did you live your life for God? Did you live your life with an understanding that one day you were coming into judgment and God wanted the talents of your life to bring him a profit? Did you do that? The third judgment here, and by the way, the first judgment there is a heaven or hell judgment. Okay. The second two judgments, the judgment of talents could be, you know, it could be a heaven or hell judgment for some that have co totally refused accountability to God. The third judgment here is also a heaven and hell judgment. It doesn't mean if you're saved and you're, you know, not treating everyone the way that you should, you're going to go to hell. What it means is if you're not loving people, it's a sign that you don't know Jesus Christ. Okay. This is the, the, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. So the sheep are on the one side. And he said, Hey, when I was hurting, you were there. I was sick and in prison. You visited me. I was naked. You clothed me hungry. You fed me. And they said, no, Lord. And by the way, notice both groups call him Lord. Bo both people say that he's Lord, but the one, the group on the left, has no compassion. They do not have, they don't visit people who are sick and in prison, don't clothe the naked, feed the hungry. They're not compassionate people, okay? Judgmental, harsh, selfish, however you want to describe them. But these people over here, they don't understand they're doing it to Jesus. They just, they just see a person on the side of the street, okay? Now, I don't, I don't help everyone uh, that I see on the side of the street, but I, I do have a soft spot for women and children. Uh, and for men who are handicapped. Now, if you're an able-bodied man, it doesn't mean that I'd never help you. It just means I'm, I'm more sympathetic to people who look like they can't help themselves. And I carry a, an amount of money in my pocket to give away. It specifically is in my wallet to give it away. And what I tell the Lord is, show me who to give that away to. I, I just, and, and it's just amazing. The last time I gave money away, I was in a restaurant. There was a young waitress and uh, she, the Lord said, give, give her your money today. And she walked up to my table and, and I said, here, th this is for you. And she said, well, I'll be back with your change. And I said, honey, there's no change. That's for you. And she started crying. And she just said, you'll never, never know what this means to me. Wipe, wiping the tears away from my eyes. I don't know what it means to her. But all I know is I was obedient to give to her because I want to live my life to help people. I want all of the advantages that God has given me. I want to live my life to help the disadvantaged. And one day when Jesus returns, he's going to say to you, okay, did you love me? The, the people, the disadvantaged, the, the Jews, I believe that there is a specific judgment for the nations of how they've treated Jesus. Imagine Germany in the 1940s and how they're going to be able to measure up to that judgment is that there's a judgment on how did we love the brethren of Jesus, the Jewish people. But there's also a judgment of how did we treat people in general? Now, the people on the left, the goats, they called him Lord. The, they ident the virgins identified with Jesus. The five foolish virgins, 
they, they were virgins of the bridegroom, but they just had to have a relationship with him. And that kept them from entering in. The uh, sheep or the goats on the left, they call him Lord. They believed that they have a relationship with him. Let me give you an example of this. And that is, there are Christian denominations that give money to groups that provide abortions. I just don't consider them my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I, I know that's a terrible thing to say. How can you kill an innocent child and say that you love Jesus Christ? You know, that God creates us in our mother's womb. Psalm 139 says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. How can you have so, no compassion whatsoever to an unborn child in a mother's womb and expect anything good to come from that? I'm saying, are you a compassionate person? Are you a person that cares about other people? Are you, because Jesus said, when you did it to them, you did it to me, even though you didn't realize it. So you can't disassociate the way that you treat people from your relationship with Jesus. Let me say this another way. And, and just in case I haven't riled you up enough already, uh, mean people go to hell. Now, all of us can be mean sometimes. You know, in traffic, I have to admit, sometimes I have a bad attitude. Um, but mean people, people who are just mean. And you go on social media today, there are people killing themselves because of what people are saying to them on social media. Absolute brutality. Uh, bullying, rage, just vindictiveness. And you see it in our society today. And so you see the meanness. I'm telling you right now, that meanness is going to be met with judgment. If you're a mean, selfish, vindictive kind of a person and you don't care, A, about the suffering of other people and A, the suffering that you cause for other people, there's going to be a judgment for that one day. And we're going to be called into an account for everything that we've done good or bad in our lives. And if you're a Christian, you know, God forgives the bad, but he remembers the good. And let me say, Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to one of the least of these over here, to one of these little ones over here, you will not lose your reward. Again, I want to say, you don't have to climb Mount Everest to get God's attention. If you help a child, if you give a cup of cold water to a child, if you help a vulnerable person, if you're just a nice, loving person, especially when you do it to glorify God, there is a great reward. I want to say one more time, it is very important the way that we treat the Jewish people. The Jewish people are precious to God and a Jew cannot be saved without knowing Jesus is their Messiah. But the Jewish people are special by covenant and God remembers his covenant with them. And the whole nation will be saved in one day, the Bible says. So we need to be ready for judgment. Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Are you ready for judgment? Now we're going to go right now into the segment where I'm talking about Israel is threatening to attack Iran because Benny Gantz, the defense minister of Israel, is saying Iran is eight weeks away from a nuclear weapon. I'll also be answering questions. Now, this is a subscription only part of the show. If you are a subscriber now to endtimes.com, you have to go to endtimes.com to watch the entire segment. So if you're a subscriber, go over to endtimes.com. There you'll be able to watch the entire uh, podcast. If you're not a subscriber, I want you to become a subscriber. We, we have guests that are coming up that we're scheduling all different kinds of segments that are coming up. We have articles that come out all week long. We have this podcast that comes out. It's about a 40, 45 minute podcast every week, but the whole podcast is only viewed by subscribers, $7 a month, $77 a year. I would love to have you join me as a subscriber. And I can tell you what, it will be a good investment of your $7 for peace, for understanding, and all the nonsense that's going on in the world right now. One of the things I love doing is helping people to understand what's happening so it'll give you peace and so you can help other people. $7 a month, $77 a year. When you sign up for the monthly, the first month is free. So you can check us out. Go to endtimes.com and subscribe. Stay tuned for the subscriber portion.